Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today I'm going to get around to discussing a film I've wanted to talk about for a long time. This is one of my all-time favorite films, and I'm talking about 1981's Body Heat, starring William Hurt and a then relatively unknown Kathleen Turner. I, I love everything about this movie. I love the sweat and the heat of the Florida summer. I love the noir music by John Barry. I love the semi-hard-boiled dialogue. And the whole premise is just fascinating. I can just watch this movie over and over again and never get tired of it. And... And, even though this film seems to be cut and dry, open and case, shut nice as you please, this film is crying out for a sequel. I don't know why none has ever happened. Hell, I'll write it. I'll even star in it. Because William Hurt's pretty old, Kathleen Turner's not in the best of health. I'll do it. This film also happens to have the distinction of being, I believe, the first film that I ever saw on a newfangled device called a VCR, a top loader. We watched it in my uh, friend's uh, rec room slash basement, he popped in the, the videotape, and we watched it on the projection screen TV, which looked kind of like a... You know, like three torpedo tubes, you know, red, blue, and green with a with a movie projector screen that had been pulled down from the ceiling. And so we turn back the clock to 1981, the brutally hot town of Miranda Beach, Florida, which appears to be fictional. And a local somewhat sleazy lawyer named Ned Racine, played by William Hurt. A guy characterized as being inept at his job. He's not very good at lawyering. I'm not really sure if that's the case. He's a smart guy. I just don't think he gives two poops about his job. He's just sort of rolling from one case to the next. And as this is a kind of a noir film penned by the and directed by the great Lawrence Kasdan, you get a lot of subtle hints and clues as to characters' motivations are just dropped in as casual dialogue, but actually mean a lot. And early on in the film, Ted Danson, who plays uh, Peter Lowenstein, assistant prosecuting attorney for this crappy little county that they live in in Florida, mentions to him, you know, uh, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. You've been out looking for that quick score you've always been searching for. And I think that mostly highlights this character of Ned Racine. Just this, you know, good-looking guy who is just trying to score quick, get rich fast, and everything else is just sort of a drag. Ned Racine is a, a known woman's man. There's always a fresh nurse, a new denim skirt for him to climb into. He's his bed sees a lot of traffic. He's a chain smoker. He would not probably do as a modern leading man with the concept of toxic masculinity being thrown about with nauseating abandon these day and ages. Ned Racine is probably a classic example of that. Hard smoking, hard drinking, womanizing guy just looking to hop in the sack with anything with a pulse. He goes out one evening trawling the the local uh, jazz shells off the beach, trying to get some cool air, trying to find his next encounter. And a woman stands up as the, as the jazz music rises and the wind blows in from the sea. A woman in a blouse and a skirt that he just he just can't get enough of and he pulls the old Ned charm on this lady seeing if he can get a quick and easy for the night she tells him bug off I'm married he persists he's not gonna be undone this is uh, right up his alley and he's not gonna 
let this pass without a intense struggle as he tells her, you know, you know, in 45 minutes, I'm just going to get up and go away. And then another telling piece of dialogue from this woman, and it kind of comes and goes, you might not think of it, but it's actually pretty important. She says, you're not too smart, are you? I like that in a man. And you might think that's just casual conversation as these two begin talking, but it's actually pretty telling. You know, she's looking for a dumb guy to do something dumb for her, and Ned just might be the dumb guy of her dreams. We'll see. Oh, before I continue, obviously I'm gonna spoiler alert. This is getting on. This movie's getting on 40 years old. I'm gonna be spoiling it. There's really nothing to hide. So if you had figured out already, this is a spoiler review slash analysis. We continue. He tries to put the moves on her. She's not really having it, although she is amenable to co uh, quaint conversation. He gets her a cherry snow cone, and she mentions something about uh, she spills some of it on her chest, and she mentions you want to lick it off. And he goes in to get a paper towel to help clean it off. When he comes out, she's gone. So he's left frustrated for the evening. But old Netty boy just can't get this girl off his mind. You see him kind of rolling from one trice to the next. But always in his head is this woman that he met that night by the beach as the band played and he postulated and she had confirmed that she comes from a town called Pinehaven which apparently is more of a ritzy well-to-do place and he begins searching for her to see if he can bump into her again and this time perhaps a bit more have a bit more success in his attempts to seduce her he hits the the band shell again she's not there he heads out to Pinehurst and starts trawling the local taverns, which look distinctly 80s. Man, I mean, bars have come a long way. You know, lots of neon, lots of bounce, better music, uh, Wi-Fi. Of course, there was no Wi-Fi in 81. This bar looks boring as hell, but anywho. He walks in and there she is, sitting at the corner at the corner bar stool and this has been parodied in other movies as he saddles up and she lets him sit and she tells him you know other men have tried that bar seat and didn't get very far he begins his his shtick again trying to wheedle his way in and she mentions she's got a lot of wind chimes that at her house that indicate a cool breeze is blowing although this season it's just hot air and he talks her into letting him see the chimes <laughs> I mean that's about as high school uh, he couldn't care less about wind chimes who cares about wind chimes she um, tells him she's married and he's got to leave first and then to continue the charade she slaps him across the face and leaves and then he follows her home sees that she lives in a kind of a half-assed 70s looking mansion right there on the beach they go in and she shows him her balcony full of wind chimes and then asks him to leave but he's he's got a whiff of her and he's not gonna let her go she finally says i'm i'm, I'm a weak person you know, I'm not tough, and she gives him a kiss and sends him out, and he heads back to his beaten up Corvette, thinks about it, and then heads back, tries the door, it's locked. She's standing there with her hand on her crotch. I mean, very uh, iconic scene. Tries the door, it's locked. Tries the window, it's locked. Grabs a potted plant, throws it through, and has the amazing John Barry music plays he seduces this woman Maddie Walker is her now I don't know if I've said her name and that begins the rest of the film they begin having a a torrid affair her husband Edmund Walker is always gone during the week 
doing business. What his business is, is unknown. She mentions he can't stand him. He doesn't seem to be completely legit. And he's played by Richard Crenna. These two continue their weekly affair and Ned sort of disappears and Ted Danson even mentions it. He sees her at the local bar, at the, not the bar, the local Greasy Spoon. He orders two teas as he normally does, sits down with him. Where you been? And Maddie had told him, you can't tell anyone. And he does that. He just says, ah, you know, I've been, been around won't say and then their other friend Oscar Grace played by J.A. Preston a cop sits down and delivers some some cool semi noir dialogue he asks him how business is going he goes oh it's hopping oh he starts hopping when gangs get hot people wake up tired get cranky and never recover people think the old rules don't apply that it's emergency time time out it's one of my favorite lines of dialogue well delivered by j.a preston the relationship between ned racine and maddie walker is the the highlight of the film as they become more and more intense in their affair they begin whispering like, well, what um, if you were to divorce Richard Crenna, Edmund Walker, your, your husband, what, what, how would you be looking? Would you be fat? Would you get a lot of money? And she's like, no, no, I, I, I signed a pretty nasty prenup. You know, I'd get a money for about a year, not much. And then that's that's about it. And he's disappointed because, again, he's... He's looking for that quick score, and apparently a divorcing her, her husband, Richard Crenna, isn't going to supply that, you know, so he's like, well, we're just going to have to just, right around the time in the film is when Ned meets an old high school friend of Maddie Walker by the name of... Marianne Simpson, and in fact, he sees her from behind, standing on the gazebo, thinks it's Maddie, walks up, says something lewd, and she turns around and realizes it's not her, and he's embarrassed and full of apologies. But uh, Maddie Walker doesn't seem to think anything of it. She, uh, Matt, uh, this Simpson lady laughs says her goodbyes and she leaves and you never see her again in the film but her name comes up again and it will be important later on in the evening he goes out to get a, a bite of dinner and lo and behold there's maddie walker with her husband edmund walker they mention she mentions uh, he's a lawyer from upstate and was looking into purchasing their home and Ned Racine quick quick on the uptake and said, yeah, is it, it hasn't changed, is it? You haven't changed your mind about selling it? And he's like, oh, no, 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 we love the place. And he invites him to sit down to dinner. And they start talking and Kathleen Turner excuses herself while they while they have a, a man talk. He says, you know, when I, when I met her, she was with this loser, you know. This guy was looking to score quick. But he didn't have the goods. And it's almost like he's talking about Ned, a guy who wants to get rich fast, but doesn't quite have all the goods, isn't bringing the, the whole package with him, wants everything nice and quick and easy. And Edmund Walker says, you know, that's how you, I, knew, I knew the guy was full of shit, because he wasn't willing to take steps, take do the necessary things that had to be done. And, Ned Racine doesn't quite understand, and he explains anything, whatever it takes. And then that's what puts the seed in Ned Racine's head about killing Edmund Walker and taking the money. And as he starts to talk to Maddie about this, has their, their thoughts and their conversation takes a dark turn, she's hesitant she's like no no we we can't talk about this ned it, when you talk about things things become real 
And he's like, no, no, it'd be nice and sweet if he was gone, wasn't it? Wasn't like he doesn't deserve it. Illegitimate guy, he's working with the mob. Apparently, they never quite say who his associates are. You assume it's the mob, but never quite says. And he doesn't really seem like that bad of a guy, Richard Crenna, Edmund Walker. He is always nice to... Kathleen Turner, and he, he seems to be devoted to his niece, uh, Heather, Heather Craft, the daughter of his, of his sister, Roz, he brings her over, and he listens to her stories, and really likes her a lot, and even has a significant portion of his estate willed to her in the event of his death, and that, uh, becomes a sticking point later on, as they begin planning his murder and they have lots of time to do this since he's always gone during the week kathleen turner starts bringing up this little girl heather craft his niece and she says well his sister roz really keeps heather on his mind always sharing her report cards and her little milestones and accomplishments you can tell she's very envious and as they continue to talk the talk goes to the will of Edmund Walker and how he has this little girl as a major beneficiary of his estate it's not all of it you know it's and that pisses Kathleen Turner off she does not want to share with Heather Craft and she puts it to, she tries to put it to Ned in a in a in a light that well it, actually if she got this money Heather wouldn't see a cent of it it would all go to her mother Roz and and she can't stand that which is not true because he had set up a, a trust for Heather which would make it difficult for Roz to get her hands on the money it's just what it is she's just trying to hide the fact that she's greedy and that she doesn't want to share with nobody and that should have been a red flag for William Hurt right there and then oh boy you know this lady's ruthless in a very passive aggressive sort of way but in a very persistent way and Ned Racine is like well no you, you know we're planning on killing this guy Nothing out of the ordinary in his life can happen because Maddie Walker, Kathleen Turner starts talking about changing the will, you know, and she's like, well, you know, we could do this and you're a lawyer, you know how to write a will. And he's like, no, 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 we, we can't do anything like that. You can't just submit a brand new will and then the guy dies. That doesn't look very good, does it? No. Nothing weird can happen to Edmund Walker Richard Crenna at this point in time. No, you're going to be satisfied with the riches that you get. And then she relents. Flash forward a few days. Ned Racine has a, a seedy client, kind of a sleazy guy, uh, played by Mickey Rourke. And his name is... Teddy Lewis, who is a petty thief and a demolitions expert. And Ned all of a sudden is wanting Mickey. And this is pre-disfigurement Mickey Rourke. This is when Mickey Rourke was a handsome young guy. This is before all the boxing, before he became a, a grotesque harlequin. So he wants old Mickey Rourke to show him how to make a a bomb that burns nice and hot and Mickey Rourke's like you know uh, I can show you how to do this but you know arson is a bad crime man and my advice to you is to don't do it just don't do it just and that Racine's like now just show me and he builds him a bomb and Edmund Walker's group his syndicate or whatever they own this dilapidated property on the beach near where Ned lives called the breakers and his plan is to is to torch the breakers with Edmund Walker's body in it so it looks like he was torching the lot to clear it for insurance money or whatever and had an accident and, and died 
as a result of misadventure. So the fateful day arrives at last. Ned is ready to do the deed that evening and sort of an interesting scene pops up where he's getting in his car and down the street he sees a old timey looking car driven by a kind of creepy looking clown playing like calliope music and as the clown passes Ned sort of looks at him in astonishment watching him pass by and I always wondered what that scene was doing there it's obviously there for a purpose it was edited into the film they shot it and I think what it signifies is Ed's or Ned's innocence abandoning him the clown, I think, represents his innocence. It's ugly and dirty and seedy and not much to look at, but still, it's still brightly painted and playing delightful music as it passes. You know, at this point, he's lived kind of a fly-by-night life, but he hasn't done anything really bad yet. I think that's what that signifies. The fateful night comes. Kathleen Turner is screwing Edmund Walker hard so that he can't hear the sounds of someone breaking in, but he finally does hear it, and he puts his glasses on, goes down the stairs to see what's up. There's Ned Racine, and Kathleen Turner flips on the light and says he's got a gun, and the two men struggle, and... William Hurt bops him on the head with a, a, a two by what looks like a two by four. Well, I mean, what? That's an odd murder weapon, you know, a two by four. But I guess that's what he used. Hits him once, kills him, and Richard Crenna shuffles off to the Rambo franchise to continue his acting pursuits. They dress him up. He takes him out to the breakers, drags him in, dr uh, drops a heavy timber on him. And then places the bomb and then hours later it explodes and burns the place down with Edmund Walker's dead body in it. And then he tells Maddie Walker, we can't see each other for a long time. You know, it's for allow things to die down. But oddly enough, a few days after the, the death, he gets a call from an, a lawyer from Miami who wants to talk about Edmund Walker and his estate. And Ned Racine's kind of curious, like, why is this lawyer calling me? I'm not supposed to really know Edmund Walker. And he says, um, we're coming. We have a, an association with a firm near you. I was wondering if you could stop by. And we, we have a slight problem that we need to discuss with you. He's curious. He goes, and there is the there's the lawyer. There's Maddie Walker, Kathleen Turner. There's Roz Craft, his sister, and Heather Craft, his daughter. A bunch of other people, and the lawyer from Miami starts discussing Edmund Walker's will, and he talks to Ned as if she he should know about Edmund Walker's will, and he's playing along like yeah he's just sort of letting the lawyer lead he says well as you know Edmund Walker passed away recently and I discovered that he had submitted a new will shortly before his death and he hadn't uh, known anything about it and he said uh, according to his wife he wanted to uh, redistribute a few trivial items nothing big and he decided to do it upstate for simplicity's sake and then everyone starts smoking and the room fills with a noxious gas and he says we have a problem with the will that you submitted mr racine in rewriting the will he violated the rule against perpetuities which in wills means that you can't put a codicil in a will 
that goes very far into the future. I think the the, the limit is like 21 years. It's called the Dead Man's Hand or the Dead Man's Rule in a, in a will where you can't exert control over the living that far into the future. And apparently in this new will that had been submitted allegedly by Ned Racine, he did just that in, in regards to some items that would be distributed to Heather. The, his niece and that essentially renders the will invalid and that means Edmund Walker died in Castay which hey, as if he had no will at all and in the state of Florida when someone dies without a will all the estate goes to the spouse so Kathleen Turner Maddie Walker inherits everything and the lawyer kind of comments on Ned Racine's poor lawyering skills and then advises Maddie Walker it was obvious and clear that he intended his niece Heather to benefit and to keep that in mind going forward and Kathleen Turner's like of course of course I, I certainly will but obviously she has no intention of letting that little girl see a whiff of that money what had happened was as Ned Racine explains later, she got a hold of his stationery. She wrote the will and intentionally messed it up so that his will would be invalid. His, his niece and made it similar enough that it wasn't really a big change in terms of the disposition of items, but that it, the wording would make it invalid. And decided to use Ned and his notoriously bad lawman skills to take the fall. Afterwards, his friends Peter Lowenstein and J.A. Preston, Oscar Grace, meet at Ned's house. He's like, how in the name of hell did you get messed up with this Maddie Walker? And he says, well, it, he's making things up as he goes along well you know she and her husband came up and needed to a quick revision to his will it was pretty simple and they go well take some incredibly good advice and stay away from her this woman may have just killed her husband they're already suspecting that Edmund Walker didn't die in a fire by misadventure that it was in fact murder Ned Racine is like, well, I'm sorry, guys, but if you didn't notice today, she started coming on to me. And also, if you hadn't noticed, she's about to come into a hellacious amount of money. And I'm going to go there every day or every night that she'll have me. And Ted Danson laughs and goes, you know, Ned, your dick is going to get you into a pretty bad hassle. And Oscar Grace, J.A. Preston, he goes, yeah, you know, Ned, you've screwed up before and you'll screw up again. It's your nature. But that was all, all pretty trivial stuff. We're getting into big time major league stuff here. So just watch yourself. But then shit goes off the rails fast. What he thought was the perfect crime is highly flawed. He learns from his friends, Peter Lowenstein and Oscar Grace. It's pretty obvious that Edward Walker, or Edmund Walker, sorry, was murdered someplace else, driven there in his own car. He was a stickler for a pair of metal rim glasses that he always wore, and you see him wearing them in the movie. And they were not on his body. He, if they, The heat would have seared them into his flesh. They're not there. That's a big red flag. Also, they got a big problem with this will that he allegedly did and was witnessed by a Marianne Simpson who has since vanished. Oscar Grace wanted to depose her to interview her. Can't find her. Apparently, she was on her way to Europe and that was the last anyone ever heard or saw of Mary Ann Simpson and they want to know what's up with that so he starts questioning Maddie and 
starts getting forceful like what happened to the glasses where are the glasses and he's yelling and screaming and she's putting on a suitably sorrowful face things just uh don't seem to be going well in this in this conspiracy and then there's the the matter of heather heather was staying at the walker's mansion she had a nightmare she woke up looked for her aunt maddie goes downstairs and sees her engaged in a fellatio encounter with a man with slick back hair. Ted Danson tells Ned, and they're becoming more and more suspicious of Ned as time goes on. They said this little girl is here who, who saw a, a strange dude having oral sex with Maddie Walker. Well, they said, you know, we suggest you go out the back. Her mother is a basket case. But he straightens his tie, he goes out there, and he shakes her hand. And she doesn't recognize him because that night he had been swimming in the water and his hair was slicked back. And she was, uh, he was also uh, exposed, and that was really all she could remember was his exposed male genitalia. But then, Oscar tells Ned, the night of the murder his hotel room in Miami, he received a number of calls throughout the night, call after call from a person who demanded to be transferred to his room, and his phone just rang and rang, and nobody ever answered. And then they tell him somebody has been in contact with the police who has Edmund Walker's glasses, once is in active negotiation with the police to give them to the cops. Cops don't know what the glasses will tell them, if anything, but the negotiations are continuing. It becomes obvious at this point that Maddie is not all she said she was. All this evidence is mounting up implicating Ned in the murder of Edmund Walker. She calls him one evening and says, I've got the glasses and they're in the boathouse. The boathouse is this little shack, a dilapidated shack where they'd had sex many times. She says, just go there, go inside there. It's in the top drawer of the dresser in the boathouse. And she says, everything is going to be all right in a reassuring manner. But then Teddy, Mickey Rourke, who's in jail, who has contacted another, a new lawyer, tells Ned Racine that he got a call from a, from a lady who wanted him to teach her how to strap a, a booby trap bomb to a door. And that's uh, quite shocking, obviously. Ned goes to the boathouse, looks in the window, and sees a some sort of wire dangling from the door, and that the door is in fact booby trapped. And at this point, Ted Danson and Oscar Grace decide to go pick Ned up. They have enough evidence against him now to come and get him and he has a final confrontation outside the mansion with Maddie Walker where he he under finally understands that she had been gaslighting him from the beginning and that a lawyer who had been previously involved in a lawsuit against Ned for it, uh, legal malpractice had met this hot looking chick at a bar and told her about him to try to give him some work because he felt bad for suing him and that he was generally a uh, an incompetent lawyer especially when it came to wills and that's what attracted to her to him in the first place and that this entire time hit their supposedly random meeting at the band shell in miranda beach the initial hard to get the subtle subtle manipulations into eventually talking him into murdering her husband submission of a of a fraudulent will all pre-orchestrated ned tells her well, why don't you go into the boathouse and get the glasses and she says all right and then she walks away she says you know i didn't expect to fall in love with you but i did and, and I, I i love you Ned. and she walks towards the boathouse and then he starts running after her as the cops show up 
and there's a massive explosion and the boathouse is destroyed and then the final scene you see Ned in prison talking to Oscar Grace they found her teeth or her body in the boathouse and they have her teeth and they match up with Maddie Tyler Walker but then Ned starts to postulate he says Maddie had a high school friend named Mary Ann Simpson the lady who allegedly witnessed the signing of the will and he'd seen her one night before and accidentally propositioned her because he thought she was Kathleen Turner which she was actually not she's Kim Zimmer different actress and he starts to wonder Maddie and Mary Ann weren't who they said they were that maybe Maddie Tyler Walker and Mary Ann Simpson had at one point switched identities in a scheme to get rich quick Kim Zimmer uh, motives appear to be for money and as we saw with Edwin Walker's niece Heather Kathleen Turner wasn't interested in sharing any money that was just a, a wild speculation on his part Oscar Grace doesn't buy he says we got her teeth she's dead she got all this money and we can't find it so somewhere out there in some lonely bank account there's all this money waiting for a dead woman to come collect it but Ned wasn't done he gets a copy of her high school yearbook looks inside and sure enough the woman who claimed to be Maddie Tyler Walker Kathleen Turner was actually Mary Ann Simpson and Mary Ann Simpson was actually Maddie Walker or Maddie Tyler they switched identities and then Kathleen murdered her probably just to keep all the money for herself so she wouldn't have to share it and would neatly in this whole murder affair where if Ted Ned Racine had walked into the boathouse it would have blown up cops would have found two bodies two murderers Ned Racine and Maddie Tyler Walker while the real one escaped and her her greatest ambition in her yearbook was to get rich and live in an exotic locale the final final scene is you see a suntan Kathleen Turner sitting on a beach someplace getting a handed a drink from some dude with lush tropical mountains in the background and that's where it ends so that's body heat amazingly tight little film lots of twists and turns lots of everything is spelled out but nobody really gets anything until it's already come to pass now as I mentioned this film is crying for a sequel you'd figure the movie is buttoned up tight not Ned Racine's in prison he took the fall for the murder of Edmund Walker Kathleen Kennedy gets away Scott free we got a figure this movie came out in 1981 at that time William Hurt was 31 years old Kathleen Turner was a little younger she's probably 28 29 years old there is a lot of room for story left over let's review what charges Ned Racine was facing from these from this affair and how many years it's gonna take him to get out of prison so the big one obviously is murder one the murder of Edwin Walker which carries a usual sentence of 20 years to life in prison the next big one is the arson of the breakers the murder scene where he left Edmund Walker's body and then torched the lot and you have a bunch of lesser crimes you have conspiracy you have conspiracy to commit murder you have fraud you have trespassing you have obstruction of justice the list could go on and on how many charges he is facing for the death of Edmund Walker but you gotta figure first-time offender never been a violent person he's a ex-lawyer he knows how to or he's a lawyer he knows how to work the system none of these charges are gonna be held or are gonna be served back to back everything is concurrent so that 20 20 years to life sentence is 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 it 
and since he's a first-time offender, the possibility of parole with good behavior is in the air. Therefore, if he keeps his nose clean, if he behaves himself in prison, he's looking to get out of prison in maybe 10 to 15 years. That puts him squarely in his mid 40s, 45, 46 years old, still young, still plenty of time to hunt down Kathleen Turner. So where did where did Kathleen Turner go? I have a, a, a number of of theories. So at the end, the man handing her a drink is speaking Portuguese. So unless she is in Portugal, she's probably somewhere in Brazil possibly Rio, possibly some other resort, seaside area, Brazil, in Brazil there's a lot of those. Brazil makes good sense as she's out of the United States, free of any extradition charges which might be pending from the whole Edmund Walker affair. If Ned Racine gets out when he's 45 46 since he he couldn't ever get her, get her out of his head throughout the movie he's probably still on his mind as he's released as, as he's a free man if i were him if i were writing this i'd get boots on the ground in brazil in in the in the usual places rio uh brasilia you know any any seaside town in brazil that has a a tropical look and a touristy feel is fair game also he got some other usual suspects if she decides to move on from brazil so there's tahiti fiji samoa places outside the united states jurisdiction where she could hang out and get mixed drinks handed to her all the time that would make for a great film hunting down Kathleen Turner. Now, of course, in this day and age, William Hurt is pushing 70. Kathleen Turner is um, fell off the radar due to uh, bad diva-like behavior on set. The onset of severe arthritis and her health generally deteriorated, picked up a lot of weight from the medication to combat her arthritis. And also to seek some shelter from the pain she became an alcoholic or at least lost control of, of her drinking for a time so you get but you don't really need them get fresh actors to play these roles in their appropriate age and we have a film we hunt down kathleen turner or maddie tyler walker or marianne simpson however you whatever you want to call her She's probably not covering her tracks all that well since she figures Ned's in jail. Uh, and she pulled off a pretty tidy murder where everyone else is taking the fall for her. But so she's probably not got her guard up. You could get to her if you really tried. You, you check out Brazil, you could probably find her. If she's not there, check Fiji, Tahiti, Samoa possibly the canary islands maybe uh, maybe some of the more exotic islands off of africa like mauritius or madagascar who knows i'm sure she's gonna get tired of one place and move on before too long happens just to step ahead stare stay ahead of any pending interlopers who might get wise to her Cherry's doing so anyways that's body heat that's just my speculation my wants if you will i'd love to actually see this movie I, i'll like i said i'll write it i'll star in it it'll be great anyways if you haven't seen this film i highly recommend it it's a great film for a saturday night preferably somewhere in the middle of summer when it's hot and you can kind of get that sweaty sensation as you watch it there's a lot of sweat in this movie anyways this is ren presents i'm your host ren peace out